when someone brings up Leviticus, I admit my mind turns almost automatically to the law of Moses, which doesn't always seem like the most applicable thing to my life. However, reframing Leviticus to be thinking about the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I can't think of anything more important to me or to Latter-day Saints. We'll discuss the end of the book of Exodus and parts of Leviticus in this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communication specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Hill is a research fellow at the Maxwell Institute. And each week, we discuss the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we are joined by our colleague, Dr. Jennifer Lane, a Neil A. Maxwell Research Associate at the Institute. Jennifer is Professor Emerita of Religious Education at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, where she also served as Dean of Religious Education and Associate Academic Vice President for Curriculum. She has published extensively on the Latter-day Saint Scriptures and is the author of the recent book, Finding Christ in the Covenant Path, Ancient Insights for the Modern World, published in 2020 by BYU's Religious Studies Center. Welcome, Jennifer, to the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And we are thrilled to have you. Now, Christian, what's going on in this block of scripture? So John Goldingay usefully outlines Leviticus in terms of the kinds of things that a priestly theologian might want to stress. These are, he says, how to offer sacrifices, Leviticus 1 through 7, how to stay pure, avoid taboo and deal with taboo, Leviticus 11 through 16. Those chapters, interestingly, include a narrative section, Leviticus 8 through 10, that describes how the first priests were ordained, how things went wrong, and how God put them right. Finally, the last portion of the book stresses how to be holy, chapters 11 through 27. This latter section is often referred to as the holiness code. We haven't really spoken much about the various sources that are thought by scholars to make up the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. These sources are known as the J source, for its preference for using Yahweh is the name of God in narration, the E source, because of its preference for using Elohim as the name of God up through the middle of the book of Exodus, the P source, which has a distinctive priestly language, style, and theological outlook, and includes the whole of Leviticus, and the D source, comprising most of the book of Deuteronomy, and which again displays distinctive language and style that can be seen elsewhere in the Pentateuch. The value of recognizing these sources for me is not so that I can somehow tease the Pentateuch apart, but more so that I can recognize the rich orchestration of these books and see that this effect can only be achieved over a long period of time by combining the deep devotion of a diverse group of faithful prophets and scribes. The interests of the priestly source, John Goldingay's priestly theologian, especially as found in Leviticus, perhaps seemed strange to modern Christian readers. This is not a book that we rush to. However, its theology is fascinating and important. As Walter Brueggemann and Todd Linnefeld note, the religious vision of Leviticus is based on the recognition that human beings live in a physical world of bodies, and the consequent claim that religion has to do with that physical world, and not just with what one believes. Thus, the attention to dietary laws, skin diseases, and bodily fluids which can seem off-putting to many readers, may be seen as a systematic attempt to bring the materiality of our existence into the realm of religion. It's a really interesting observation. Most importantly, they note that the notion of the shedding of blood for atonement, which permeates Christian theological thinking on the death of Jesus, cannot be understood without reference to Leviticus. There are a couple of ways that we can make Leviticus a more significant read. Firstly, it might change our experience of reading this book if whenever we read about blood, we think of purgation. Whenever we read oil, we think of consecration. And whenever we read fire, we think of God at work. And whenever we read about water, we think of cleansing. This is some ideas that come from Robert Alter's introduction to this book in his, in his wonderful translation. It's also worth considering the matter-of-factness of the ritual's not so much as the routine slaughter of animals or burning of offerings, but the ordered administration of a sacred economy. 
anyone who has worked in the temple or counted tithes and offerings or worked in the church's meatpacking plant or church farms understand how routine physical actions can be sacred work. Thanks so much for that, Christian. Jennifer, we enter into this block of reading at the tail end of the book of Exodus. What do you see as the overarching trajectory of the book of Exodus? What is God trying to do with the people of Israel in this book? Thank you for that question. I think that we're all very comfortable with the beginning of the book of Exodus. The story begins with the story of redemption, a story of moving out of bondage in Egypt and then moving towards becoming something new, a covenant people. But Sometimes we get to the Ten Commandments and think, okay, that's the end of the story. But where we're picking up today is after that. And I think that, that seeing where are we going once the covenant's made really is, is helpful for us because as Latter-day Saints, we're all sort of at that point, we've made covenants, now what do we do? And I was reading, and I love keeping le- reading and learning more things, so just recently, a volume by Nathan Bills, A Theology of Justice and Exodus. His insights helped make more clear for me why so much time and energy is spent in the second half of the book of Exodus on the story of the building of the tabernacle. So what he observes is that the first part of Exodus, we see the children of Israel building and worshiping for an imposter king, but that by the end, we see them being recreated as God's people and making a covenant and learning to worship and serve Jehovah in that covenant. And I'll quote here, by first building God's space among themselves, end quote. So what they're building and the very process of building can be seen as an apprenticeship that people are choosing to participate in. And there's a beautiful phrase in Exodus 35, verse 21, where the people bring their offerings willingly as their hearts were stirred up. So no one, unlike under Pharaoh, where people were coerced to be builders, Now, even the covenant people are being invited, and then they're choosing of their own free will to participate, which tells us a lot about worship. They're choosing to participate, and as they do so, that building becomes a chance to grow and to change. And so this offering willing obedience, learning to build in wisdom, and then, of course, building according to the Lord's pattern, where there's the Sabbath rest, which, of course, they didn't have anything like that back in Egypt that allows them to learn how to become the Lord's people, his covenant people. Again, another quote here from Bills. Israel builds to Yahweh's glory, and in so doing, the people manifest God's presence and order with gratitude, obedience, wisdom, and rest, just as the finished functioning shrine will do. The tabernacle building crystallizes Israel's identity as priestly royalty who build justly towards a common sacred ground, end quote. So there's this amazing contrast from the injustice and the the way they were being coerced to build at the beginning of, of Exodus. And now we see this transformation as Israel is becoming the covenant people by choosing to work together to build the tabernacle. And so that's part of why we have chapter after chapter, so much detail is that the building is part of a recreation of the people. I think that's a it's a beautiful insight to help make sense of how this book ends and why so many chapters are spent on the particulars of the tabernacle. This is a really lovely insight, Jennifer. I, I, I've often read the tabernacle story as one in which the tabernacle itself is a new creation, and, and, and this is reinforcing the notion of God as creator and God laying out creation. But what, what a wonderful insight to actually see this as the recreation of a people, and they're becoming something entirely new through the process of being involved in the sacred work. That's really lovely. Yeah, this is something that African Americans, especially as they are being released from bondage under slavery, identify with the Exodus narrative of God calling them out of bondage and making them a great people. I'm also thinking of something closer to our day with the tabernacle, though Latter-day Saints, of course, know the tabernacle at Temple Square and may have attended it. I've always been fascinated that modern Latter-day Saints looked back to the Old Testament and borrowed the sorts of things that they were doing. What's the significance of the tabernacle? So I think there's two parts. So the first part, as we've been talking about, is the the very process of building the tabernacle, which is essentially a portable temple, a temple that could be taken down and put together again because it was a tent, (laughs) Um, and the formative effect that building process had on the covenant people. But the second part, and this is where the book ends in chapter 40, is the presence of the Lord coming to dwell in the tabernacle after it was completed. And that is the end of the story. 
Now, we know it's not the end of the story of the people, and that's part of where Leviticus picks up, but that's where everything is leading to so that the presence of the Lord, can, rather than being in the cloud, it is the, the presence and the glory of the Lord come and fill the tabernacle. Something that sticks out to me is that we often have to think about these books as telling an overarching story. And this is the pinnacle, this is the climax, right, of Exodus, where the Lord comes and that's where it's fulfilled. We're leaving on a high point as we go into Leviticus. And I think it helps us understand and make sense of Leviticus. Now, just to step back, I know the reading for this week starts on Exodus 35, but it's helpful to note that in Exodus 32 through 34, we have the covenant people slipping back. And that's where you have things going wrong, the golden calf. And again, Bill's had a, a marvelous insight that, that goes back to Christian's point that we have the story of a creation, a new creation. And one way to think about the building of a tabernacle is almost as like the new creation came with a covenant, but then you have to start all over again, just like with Noah, because there's this been this fall, this, this slipping and really emphasizing the importance of having a divine presence in order for people to be their best selves, to have a just society. That's not something we can accomplish by ourselves. And so giving the tabernacle is a way of being with the people and allowing them to be and become who they need to be. I'll, I'll share one more quote here from Bill's, again, just so helpful, where he talks about humans in general and Israel in particular need Yahweh's commanding kingship and the space it creates to help elevate their liturgical imaginations in order to fund an alternative existence. So the temple points to, and I think this is something we can appreciate, a way that we can be with God. So not just a place to be with God, but a way to be with God. And so again, Bill makes this, this wonderful analogy. He talks about, for Israel, the portable dwelling of Yahweh remaps the world's moral topography according to Yahweh's good creational justice, so that there is a recreation of the world that's possible as the people of God then participate in this world that he has created. So the temple represents a world. They, they come into that world and are changed by that experience, by choosing to be a part of that presence. So it's always voluntary. People choose to come. And that's a theme that, that's very powerful as well. But this becoming and worshiping is, is just an extraordinary process. And I think, you know, looking at what's happening here, the building the tabernacle goes on for, for chapter after chapter after chapter. We finally get to Exodus 40. And here we see this language where the garments for the priests are made. We, we see this really striking breastplate for the high priest, the sort of the skirt of the robe. You have these pomegranates and little bells. So that when he goes into the Holy of Holies, you can make sure he's still alive. <laughs> One a phrase that we're familiar with, because we see it in all of our temples, is that there's this plate of gold on the forehead of the high priest that says, holiness to the Lord. And so the high priest here is both representing the people to the Lord, but also representing the Lord to the people. And so it's a place of coming together. Once all this is created, and then the priests receive this clothing, they're washed, they're clothed, they're anointed. And then finally, the walls of the courtyard are set up. At that point, it can be said, it's done. So in Exodus 40, verse 33, Moses sets up the walls of the court around the tabernacle, hangs the court gate so that there's a way to get in, but it's all sort of this liminal space where you have to move from one, the, the profane to the sacred. And at that point can say, so Moses finished the work. And at that point, the cloud covers the tent of the congregation, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. So it now becomes, and this is really the end of Exodus, this place where Israel can have the Lord Jehovah with them. They've become different, and now because they're different, they can have this more permanent, even though it's a tent and it's going to move, but a more permanent relationship that hopefully will help them become even more what they need to become. Jennifer, that's such a wonderful sort of presentation and evocation of what is happening there at the end of, of Exodus. I particularly love this, the line from Bills that you gave us, this notion of elevating the liturgical imagination in order to fund an alternative existence. Oh, well, I think that you're right. This is such a, a sort of rich idea that seems to have kind of direct applicability to our own relationship to sacred space. 
that we we've spoken a lot in this kind of series about scriptural imagination, about our ability to live into scriptural accounts. But the liturgical imagination is, I suppose, be interested for you to kind of ref- reflect on that a little bit. It's, it seems to have something to do with our ability to invest spaces with sacredness. Yeah, this is something I've been thinking more and more about in these last months, the role of, of temple worship and temple liturgy as not just a place to meet God and to be with God, but that the formative dimension of that, that that is helping to create us so that we can then go out and create the world that God wants. And my thinking on this has, has been helped and influenced by Jamie Smith, his Desiring the Kingdom and written for another work written for a more general audience, You Are What You Love, where he talks about the role of liturgy as and worship as, as sort of a turning of the heart, a changing of the heart, because we love what we worship. And in the world, we just like the children of Israel, they're slipping back into worshiping things that are familiar and comfortable. An argument that that Jamie Smith makes, I think, is very persuasive, is that the world around us, everything we participate in, has a liturgical function in that it's shaping us to love something other than God, whether it's a mall or a movie theater or a football stadium, that whatever we're participating in, we're, we're being shaped by our participation. We're changing, that there's a liturgical quality and that the very process of worshiping the Lord in ritual, in liturgy, we don't use the word a lot as Latter-day Saints, but what we have in the temple and temple liturgy, I think, is extraordinary. And the very the sense of practice, this idea of Bills uses that language as well, again, about apprenticeship, that we're learning to be and to take on a new way of being, and we have to practice that, and that we get to practice that every time we worship in the temple, and that then changes us so that we live differently outside. I think it was the same thing was happening for the Israelites as well, that learning to worship is also learning to, to set one's heart, to be oriented to God rather than setting one's heart on anything else would ultimately be distracting and distorting us from taking on the true image of and nature of God, which is what true worship can allow us to experience. Thanks. That's so beautiful. Yeah, it calls to mind the temple being a separate place for us to go into and walking up the steps to ascend to a new place. Whereas our church buildings serve a lot of purposes. For instance, one of the most powerful experiences I have had at church came in a state conference where I attended steak dances and played basketball every Saturday. And the experience that I had there was special to me because it was encased in the familiar, but I've also had experiences where in the temple where because it's set apart, it prepared me to be in a space to have the experience that that I had. I think that it's also important to recognize that the law of Moses or most anything in the book of Leviticus may seem a little bit foreign or strange to modern readers, especially modern Latter-day Saints who don't have as many high church elements, meaning that we don't have as many formal rituals in our Sunday worship as, as other religions do. So how can we make Leviticus more familiar to ourselves and, and for our students, Jennifer? Thank you. I, I think that going from Exodus 40 and this sense of the Lord coming to dwell in the tabernacle and we just never leaving that completely makes Leviticus make more sense. So we have to stay with the context of the temple being the place that, that God is coming to dwell with his people. And so everything is in terms of that. This is another great article I've recently read, Alfred marks the theology of sacrifice according to Leviticus 1 through 7. He makes this this lovely statement. Each Israelite is called to draw near to Yahweh with his offerings and to enjoy Yahweh's presence. And I'll just stop there. There's more, but the idea of enjoying Yahweh's presence, that that is, like, why would you go? Just to be there, that there is joy in the presence of the Lord. President Nelson has talked about that. If you don't enjoy going to the temple, go more often, not less that coming to enjoy being in the presence of the Lord changes us. And then it also changes us because what we want to do outside is different because we enjoy having the presence of the Spirit. Reminds me also of something that was taught 
in a family history course that I took at BYU that in order to get quality time, you have to spend quantity time. It's not just something that magically appears. And in fact, thinking about it as part of ritual, that it's part of the repetitiveness that when we have those moments that break through what might be seen as monotonous, those are the experiences that infuse meaning into the thing that we're doing all the time. That's a fabulous insight. And I think it helps us understand the role. Now, each Israelite that's called to draw near to the Lord isn't necessarily each individual isn't going to be coming every day. The priests and the Levites, they're there every day. And they're doing this over and over and over and over and over again. I was a temple worker for 10 years. And there are things you do over and over and over again. But sometimes in the very process that it opens up a space for understanding and for experiencing it. But but there is a dimension of this is, as, as Christian mentioned, this is done with bodies. It's done in, in a very real human context. And that being with the Lord isn't something in our heads. It's something we do with our bodies. It's something we do with our lives. And so what we have with Leviticus, that coming to the Lord is something that's done, that people come, they literally approach. And that and the, thing, the fact that it's willing, that they want to come is important. The sort of drawing near is, a, is an important verb. It gets translated to bring an offering, but it really is sort of coming or approaching. Another way to read it is that the offering itself is made to draw near. Because there was a limit to how far an individual Israelite could go into the presence of the Lord. There are these degrees of holiness. And so they could come perhaps within the courtyard, but they couldn't, they were themselves were not putting the sacrifice, even though they might kill the sacrifice, they were not finishing the preparation of the sacrifice. They were not putting it on the altar to be burnt which is basically like a barbecue. They, they, they weren't going into the, the tent of meeting or the tent of the, the tabernacle itself, and certainly not into the holy of holies. So even though there were limits to how far they could go, they still came. There was still this sense of to be as, as close as they could be was something that's valuable. But we also know that there were dimensions because of the holiness of the Lord that maybe they would feel like, oh, I can't come because I've done something I shouldn't do. And, and there is a, what's beautiful for me is that you have this dimension of human agency, of choosing to seek for God, coming to God, but that God also is providing means of reconciliation. And so the offerings and sacrifices are a way of being with God, but these offerings and sacrifices in certain cases we see in chapter four and chapter five can serve when needed as means that God provides to bring people who have been separated back into his presence to be able to be with him again. Many of the offerings are simply to be with God, but they, the, the offerings and sacrifices also provide ways for force correction and for this atonement that's being made through sacrifice to restore relationship, as well as just to bring the oneness and the, the togetherness. Wonderful insights, Jennifer, and, and kind of thinking about our own relationship to, to our temple. I often have thought of the temple as it's articulated in Restoration Scripture, as a as a house of learning, as a place of instruction, and people have gone so far to say that you should always be kind of thinking of something new that you're learning there. But it's really valuable this perspective you're giving us of of using Leviticus as a lens through which to view our temple worship as a place of presence, as a place of a transformation of a, of the kind of our soul, and not just as a house of learning, which of course it is. That we're we're learning things in the temple, but we're also experiencing something and encountering something, and sort of being transformed through our encounter with holiness. It's almost sort of it's almost impossible to to articulate. It's what scholars would call the numinous, and that when we encounter the numinous, this kind of holiness that we find here, that's sometimes terrifying for for ancient Israel, but now they're kind of learning to engage with it. It has this kind of effect, which we, we kind of recognize after the fact, but we can't actually see what's happening in the same way that when we sort of learn a new fact. It's really kind of a wonderful notion. I, and I think you really touched on something that's incredibly important in thinking about knowledge and learning, because we're so in, our, in modernity in the sense of knowledge as information, that to know in the sense that it's so often used in scriptures is, is more of this sort of being in a covenant relationship. And so they are, and we are learning of the Lord as we are, as we are in relationship with him, as we are acting out our relationship and coming, sort of coming to him 
that we are transformed by that. And the very process of being transformed is a kind of knowing. It's a way of, of understanding knowledge that's experiential rather than simply fact-based. And I think that the temple is, it has that ancient sense of knowing as becoming that is just extraordinarily important. Where, where Christ says in John 17 that this is life eternal, know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ who now has sent, he, he's not talking about having a database of information, that that kind of knowing is, is taking on a godly nature, a divine nature, and that it is, I think, with worship that the potential for that, that kind of knowing, a house of learning, it's heightened. And, and then, of course, we, we act it out and we continue to live it out as we go out and live our lives, but that, that it is, truly is a school when we can understand that dimension, we bring that dimension to it. Thank you for that, Jennifer. I think it's important, as you've been discussing, the individual coming to know, to become, it's important to remember, too, that as a community, ancient Israel is coming together. And through building the tabernacle, they're, of course, working together, but they also learn together what it means to maintain the Lord's presence among them. What does Leviticus tell us about how we must live together? That's fabulous. And I think what you see in Leviticus is both individual and corporate, so that there are times where people will come individually for individual reasons, but there are times where also collectively that there were sacrifices and offerings that were done on behalf of the people as a whole, and that, that both of those dimensions are real and important. And so that process of collectively worshiping allows for the Lord to collectively be with them. They have to individually come, but that collective sense of the Lord being with them as a people is so important. And so we, we do see with the, the sacrifices that are particularly made for, for different transgressions or sort of becoming, sometimes it's ritually impure and maybe even inadvertently, very, in fact, often inadvertently, we can talk more about that. But the process is there's a way for individuals to be sort of that repairing of the breach, of the distance that that's caused from the presence of God. But there's also, when we can talk more about the Day of Atonement, where it is not just an individual dealing with an individual's condition, but the sort of collective. And so how people treat each other, in fact, is often of what they need to repent of. <laughs> and But also this sort of this collective sense of, as a people, we haven't been everything we should be, and the hope that we can be made right again and start again because otherwise we get lost and trapped and spiral down and can, it's a hopeless feeling. Yeah, this is another situation where I wish that 4th Nephi was as long as 3rd Nephi so that we could learn what it takes to be a Zion people, to come collectively to the point where the Lord can be well pleased with us, not only as a group, as a church, but as individuals comprising it. I think, too, of how important it is for teams to come together or for any organization. When people trust each other, when people like each other, you can tell. And it makes an enormous difference in what you're able to accomplish based on your willingness to row in the same direction. I think then, and that is something where I think we take it for granted, but that the kind of collaborative effort that it takes for the tabernacle to continue just day in and day out to function, kind of thinking back to having been serving as an ordinance worker and then working as a group and then preparing to have people come, that it's you have one shift, then you have another shift, then you have another shift, and that, that there's a collaboration and a teamwork to facilitate other people worshiping, to facilitate other people being able to experience the presence of the Lord that takes regular, consistent coordination cooperation, teamwork. And I think we don't necessarily hear those stories, but the priests and the Levites were probably doing that kind of collective, cooperative effort to make sure that they were creating an environment where people who came felt and experienced the presence of the Lord and that they could then build collectively as a people of Israel, this sense of we are God's people, he is in our midst, as they chose to come and to experience that for themselves. I think that's the perfect place for us to end today. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media 
at at BYU Maxwell on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu slash edu. Thank you and have a great week.